I knew something wasn't looking right. Uh, okay. Mm. They well, can hear both. Can't hear both of us, or just yeah, one the, of us? yeah. The audio wasn't working on the stream itself. I just refreshed, so hopefully it's working. Can you confirm that it's working now? Because it's it looks like it's working on my end, but I just like refreshed the little mm. thing. Oh, hey, there you are. <laughs> All right, we'll back up and and redo. <laughs> yeah. <that's> so <laughs> <good>. My <laughs> bio is a, a tongue twister too with the uh, all the p words. It it it, like it really is. Private practice. Yeah, it's too much. <laughs> yeah, I gotta do it. Well, it wouldn't be a mama stream if we didn't have multiple things go wrong. So we're just gonna we're just gonna start that over. Welcome everyone to another Mental Health Monday. Really appreciate you tuning in and being here and especially uh, checking to make sure that all my shit is working because sometimes it's just not and that's a fact. Uh, so we're going to be talking tonight about the connections between nutrition, lifestyle, and mental health with Justin Bethany and super excited for this topic. I think it's going to be a really good one. If you have any questions, we have a question queue open, type it into the chat. We'll get it. We'll get it answered there. A little bit about Justin before we get started. Justin has a private practice as a psychiatric nurse practitioner in Bend, Oregon. He has been practicing as a psych NP for a little over 10 years now, seeing both children and adults for psychiatric medication management and therapy in the outpatient setting. His practice primarily focuses on those who are functional, which means working and attending school, but suffering with emotional distress like anxiety, mood disorders, ADHD. And I know um, a lot about that. I am considered like a high functioning with major depressive disorder. So <laughs> Uh, which always cracks me up whenever people say, you know, oh, you don't look depressed. Like, no shit. That's fine. I do my job. I raise my kids. I'm just depressed as fuck. <laughs> uh, Justin graduated from Massachusetts General Hospital Institute of Health Professions in 2011. And in 2020, self-published a book entitled The Mental Wellness Diet, Ancient Wisdom, Evolving Science, Modern Day Options. The book is based on the idea that if we feed our brain the nutrients it craves, we will be better able to feel and function at our best. I do have some socials, um, a website, blog, Instagram, a link to the book, a link to his Facebook and everything if you want to connect with Justin. And Justin, since the audio wasn't working the first time, thank you so much for being willing yeah, to join us today. Yeah, you nailed that intro. Yeah, oh, thank the you. The second go around was perfect. <laughs> the second go around was good. See, it's good that they couldn't hear us the first time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we do already have a question, and that question in the queue is from Bite Mark. She would like to know, what is your favorite poem? Uh, don't have a favorite poem, um, but my favorite quote is, a man can go fishing his whole life without realizing it's not the fish he's after. Oh, I quote. like that. In, in uh, college, and it stuck with me, and it's something I even think about all the time when talking to patients. So what does that quote mean to you in particular? What did it, did it mean? What did it mean to you in college? And what does it mean to you now? Um, it's yeah, I'm not really sure what it meant to me in college, uh, but it, it stuck with me. And uh, I, I think that we all kind of live this life of, of getting to these places, reaching these finish lines, then we reach these finish lines, and then we push the finish line out artificially again. And we're just always going, going, going. And um, the joke's on us because it's never the outcome that matters. It's the labor we put in. 
you know, and it's the journey and all that stuff. And so that's probably what it meant to me back then. Now, you know, a, a lot of the patients I have are highly functional, like yourself, but also suffering, uh, like you just mentioned for yourself. And many patients, many of them with ADHD and also depression, anxiety, they're very driven and I can feel it and, and I, I celebrate it with them. And their drive uh, sometimes is counterproductive for their mental health. You mm. know, finding that balance is really important with patients. So the quote, sometimes I share it with patients, helps them to realize they need to put their mind towards something. It really doesn't matter what it is, but they have to put their mind towards something and putting extent, exerting that energy, that mental energy. It's kind of like exercise. It, it feeds yourself back. And so that's what I encourage people to do, which is also the same road as self-acceptance and self-actualization and all that other good stuff. Yeah, that's great. I I like I haven't heard that quote before, but it looks like it's from Henry David Thoreau. So that's that's a really good one. I like mm -hmm. it. Thank you. What led you to become a, psychi a psychiatric nurse practitioner? Uh, sure. <laughs> my mom. So my mom was a psychiatric RN, a psychiatric mm -hmm. nurse from the 1960s all the way up until when I after I graduated college for decades. And she introduced me to the concept of a nurse practitioner right when I got out of college and I was trying to figure out what I needed to do with myself. And at first I was like, a nurse, male nurse, eh, pass. But uh, she was persuasive and she talked about the, you know, the good benefits, the good pay, the flexibility and um, the nursing tradition itself. So I took her advice and then I went to nursing school and the, the first month of nursing school, I realized that uh, medicine is about uh, treating or curing or helping the patient. But nursing is about helping the patient help themselves. And it, that just really clicked with me from the beginning. And I've been so grateful that I, she steered me in that direction. I, and I still do that today with all my patients. I love that. I love that you had that inspiration from your mom and that your mom was persistent mm -hmm. enough to be like, okay, but you don't, you're not quite getting it yet. <laughs> uh, I, I started tallying it up and she just had been right so many times. I. <laughs> At some point in my life, I decided not to disagree because she was likely right. I like that. I'm going to let my kids listen to that part of this and be like, <laughs> see, look. <laughs> now, what's the difference between a registered nurse and a nurse practitioner? Registered nurse typically is bachelor prepared. Uh, nurse practitioner is a master's degree. And then you can also go on and get your doctorate in, in nursing practice. But that still makes you a nurse practitioner. Nurse practitioner, they often call it mid-level which uh, some nurse practitioners bristle at, but uh, we are able to, we are granted the authority to practice medicine, which is to diagnose, assess, treat, cure if you can cure, but mostly there are no cures, and just treat as if you were uh, a doctor who is owning the treatment. Uh, but then we also do it with our nursing philosophy and our nursing model, in addition to the medical model, which we're granted to practice. That's great. So what are some of the mm -hmm. key differences between like the nursing model and the medical model? Well, medical model is this large shelf. And on the shelf, you look for whatever disease name you have. And then you reach on that shelf for whatever disease name underneath has the medications. You take it and you give it and you tell the patient to go home. That is, uh, <laughs> that's not a flattering description of the medical model. Medical model saves lives in acute care. But when it comes to chronic care, there's a lot of room for uh, improvement. And the nursing model is all about lifestyle, behavior, thoughts, emotions, risks for things, how you're coping. It's all about coping and how your lifestyle. And so uh, the nursing model will again reach to that shelf for the medication underneath whatever the disease name is and give you that medication. But hopefully a good nurse and a nurse practitioner will, will give you like a holistic treatment plan of like, well, how are you sleeping? You know, how are you eating? How's your relationships? How's your stress management? What do you do? Do you walk? Do you play tennis, pickleball? A lot of good doctors who do that too. However, in modern day healthcare, uh, a doctor is more expensive for many clinics to employ. And so their time is tighter. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the nurse practitioners, because we're not as expensive in many situations, or just because of tradition, we're granted more time with patients. And that's how most of us use that extra time. I read something just the other day that was like the average uh, that a doctor is supposed to spend with a patient is 15 minutes. And that blew my mind. Like, how do you get any sort of history from someone in 15 minutes? <laughs> yeah. 
no, Hippocrates does not have a famous quote about ye shall spend 50 minutes and then out the yeah. door you go. That uh, yeah, it's got. I think medicine really did kind of get bastardized by um, the healthcare industry. Yeah, we talk about that a lot. Just how much insurance and and the healthcare industry really does suck. Um, Bite says, "Yeah, Mama, how are you sleeping?" He wasn't asking me those questions. Those were not directed towards me. That's it's fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> Take that offline. <laughs> so, what are your biggest joys and biggest challenges with what you do now? Oh well, you know it can be heavy to really dive in deep. If I did just practice the medicine medical model and just handed out medications all day and pithy little uh, instructions on how to live better. Uh, that would be maybe easier and less stressful, but obviously less fulfilling. So it's a definite balance with, uh, you know, hearing people uh, and eliciting really what's going on and trying to understand and trying to find unique tailored solutions to what they're going through, or at least maybe not solutions, but the best you can do. And uh, that's just really fulfilling. But then it's a lot of work and uh, it takes me away from my family and I'm sitting in a chair all day long. That's probably yeah. the worst part for me. Yeah, that's, it is kind of a bummer. Uh, I work in an office job. It's, it's mm -hmm. the life, right? Um, but I had carpal tunnel syndrome, had to have surgery on both hands, like, and I'm 38. <laughs> that's, <Right. laughs> it's kind of like, mm. yeah. <laughs> uh, but it pays the bills. It keeps my kids fed and clothed. And that's, sure. sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. So yeah. what do you enjoy doing when you're not working? Uh, well, I got small kids, so nothing. Uh, <laughs> you mean you know, everything. You you enjoy everything. Every little second gets sucked up because they're your attention vacuum cleaners, and that's exactly how it should be. Attention that's how, exactly vacuum how it should cleaners. Be. I yeah. love that. <laughs> Sucker uppers. But uh, yeah, I actually enjoy going to the parks uh, out here in Bend, Oregon. There's so much to do outdoors at 40 parks in our little town. It's awesome. Wow. Libraries and whatnot. Yeah. So we, we do good. Uh getting outside and being outdoors for a little bit. Love to cook and some outdoor recreation. Friends, fantasy football, you know, the normal stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's it's it's good to spend as much time as you can outside, especially if you're working inside all the time, mm -hmm. um, and sitting down. Like that's kind of it's nice to have those Oh, I'm surrounded with parks and especially if you live somewhere, I don't know that you do, but especially if you can live somewhere that's walkable. Like I live in a very country farm town. It is not walkable. <laughs> yeah. Right. But it's, our neighborhood is great. Yeah. 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 You got to you got to get what you can with what you got, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I'm always walking down like there's the kids all play down at the neighbor's house. And so there's all kinds of we don't we're not surrounded by parks, but. There's all kinds of great uh, things that the kids go and do and stuff around here. So I'm not complaining about where I live. It's actually a very nice neighborhood, but it is the opposite of walkable. <laughs> oh, there is there is no food available within walking distance. There is no gas available anywhere close to here. It's it's crazy. So do you have a serial killer or true crime story that fascinates you? Uh, no, you know, I never got on that bandwagon, uh, but I did think about the answer. I remember in college, again, I, uh, I had to do a presentation on something that was fascinating to me in current events. And, and then I just looked it up again, uh, this guy named Nushan Williams, and this is kind of pretty awful in graphic, but you asked about serial killers, so I, I feel permitted, <laughs> but, uh, this guy from New York, uh, he was a young man at the time and, and uh, right before this, a few years before when I was in college in 1999, he got arrested for he had HIV and he was um, having relationships with all these women in the area, but not telling them. So there was this like mini oh, yeah. outbreak of HIV and uh, the assignment I did, I wrote about it. And the part that was fascinating to me was, you know, for violence and aggression, we always think of using our hands or using our words, but then love love can be a source of violence it's so it was so fascinating to me and um you know a related term in therapy or psychology is relational aggression which mm -hmm. is a topic that i'm always uh reviewing with my adolescent clients especially nowadays you know it's like the triangulation or you and me let's be friends and let's get close so we can ostracize the third person all this stuff and so you know in our world today when you get close to people 
uh, it, it could happen. You know, you, there could be aggression inside of close relationships. And I think that is so true and so common and so destructive and also so not acknowledged. Do you yeah. think so that was serial killer fascination. Yeah. Do you think that there has been a rise in that relational aggression recently? You said you you work a lot with your adolescent clients on mm -hmm. that. Is there a rise in that recently? No, I probably just feel like there is because the school year started and I'm starting to get oh, all yeah. the people coming. <laughs> <laughs> but probably not. Probably it's That's been the fair. same ever since. But, you know, uh, now it's like on steroids because of social media mm. and uh, the precociousness of kids. And, you know, when you and I were kids, we could do, we could egg our neighbor's house and there's no video camera of it. We'd never get caught. Right. At least I didn't. Anyways, uh, nowadays kids get caught for everything and it's just mm -hmm. that they're immature brains, they're irrational and impulsive and it's totally normal, but then totally punished. And yeah. uh, I think it is maybe harder in some ways, but maybe not more. Yeah. I mean, listen, thank God there were no cameras when I was a kid. You know how stupid I was? <laughs> Yeah, it and shaped, we, us, shaped us, yeah, allowed us yeah. to become who we are. Yep. And we would have recorded all of it and put it out there. I'm sure we would have. I'm so <laughs> thankful that that was not a thing back then. <laughs> Man, I remember the big VHS cameras you had to put it on your shoulder. <laughs> you have to carry that around. Like, that's going to slow you. That's going to slow you down. Yeah. Yeah. Now everyone has a ring camera. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. They're going to see right. you egg in their house. Or in my case, we didn't do very much egging, but we did plenty of toilet papering. <laughs> Yeah, now it's all in high def. Yeah, that's a Captured. bummer. So switching over to our topic a little bit, can you explain the fundamental ways in which nutrition and lifestyle choices impact our mental health? And what are some key factors to consider when you're looking at that? The, the book is based on uh, one main principle. One of the main principles it's based on is nutrient density. So that's for every bite of food you consume, how much is that bite of food jam-packed with the minerals, vitamins, uh, amino acids from proteins, protein factors, fats, healthy fats, omega-3s, uh, flavonoids, all the good stuff that does functional you know, processes inside the brain and body to clean the brain, to make the brain function better, to make the brain more efficient. So inside every bite of food, how much nutrients that the brain likes are jam-packed into that bite of food. So if you're comparing the pop tart to, um, you know, animal meat or uh, collagen powder or shellfish or fish or colorful vegetables and fruits, you know, there's no comparison. So we all knew that. We all know instinctively that that's true. What I tried to do in my book was make it more fun, you know, mm -hmm. to kind of turn these little nutrients into superhero characters that do their certain jobs. And so you can feel good about every time you take a bite of healthy homemade food. And now it's kind of fun and exciting versus like boring and somehow feeling punitive. And so I just said my brain likes pop charts. It told me so. And I, I mean, there are definitely those reward centers in the brain that are like, Mm -hmm. mm, sugar. <laughs> and it, it can be really hard. Like I'm, I don't really like a lot of um, sweet stuff, but I know that she does very much. And my kids really do too. And so it can be hard to say like, yes, this food that I cooked is good and good for you. And it's well balanced and all of this stuff. Um, I'm going to follow it up with a pint of ice cream. Like that's still really tempting even after you done something like that do you think that that's a product of just our society and the things that are available or is it something else food science food scientists you know those bastards they really are <laughs> ruining it for us because they're making the food taste too good and yeah. too crunchy and too sweet and too salty and too satiating and it's impossible for us to rewire our our brain circuits in one generation so it, it just came too fast and um, there's nothing against those foods. I mean, I don't have anything against those foods. It just would be like if you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know, if you can get in two out of the three of those meals, broccoli, sweet potatoes, onions, garlic, some animal protein, fish, shellfish, or supplements, you know, if you can get those in, then they're in. And if they're in, they're in your brain. And if they're in your brain, they're working. And hopefully that could turn the tide for some people who are experiencing mental health symptoms. Mm. 
hyper palatable is the term for the foods that I heard. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. That's they're engineered to be that way now, which is. Uh, yeah. Uh, palatable and hyper palatable are technical terms mm -hmm. in research and in food science. Yeah. That's what they, that's what they're aiming for. So uh, you mentioned kind of like the things that people are dealing with, mood disorders, anxiety, ADHD are pretty common challenges. Can you discuss the role of nutrition and lifestyle in managing those conditions and what potential benefits can folks expect to see for making changes in things like nutrition and things like lifestyle? Sure. I think uh, here's one kind of clinical frame is effect size. So, uh, you know, someone who has a broken bone, a cast on the broken bone in the arm is an effect size of one. It fixes it, right? Uh, let's say you have ADHD and you take uh, an amphetamine or methylphenidate, uh, one of those stimulant medications, that effect size is up there like 0.8. So 1.0 is perfectly no more problems. And 0.1 or 0.2 is just like a little bit of help. And then 0.5 is like kind of good. If you have depression or anxiety, the SSRI, the common medications are 0 0.5, 0 0.6 maybe. And so I would put food at below all of that, you know, eating healthy, uh, you know, managing blood sugar spikes, sleeping well. They're all, you know, actually sleep is probably maybe a 0 0.5 itself, but they're all 0 0.2, 0 0.3. But if you add them all up, then you get a really big effect size if you, if you make them into a transformer. You know, you got the transformer, the, the legs is sleep, and the other leg is diet, and then the left arm is exercise, and then, con you know, managing your thoughts is the right arm. I like, book, I like that. Add, you know, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, you add it all up, and, you know, it's exponentially better. And uh, mm -hmm. it just fits how we evolved. I mean, this is the instruction manual for our brains and bodies and minds to have these kind of inputs. Yeah. It's nice to hear you talk about because I've had folks join me on this podcast before where they're like, N no medication, everything can be fixed with diet exercise alone, um, which I strongly in some cases disagree with. So it's nice to hear you say like, yes, the medications oh, yeah. are going to help there at this level, but food, diet, exercise, all of those things, they can help as well if you kind of stack them up. Um, so it's, it's nice to hear that piece as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, uh, yeah. Sometimes you hear people who will say, you know, anecdotally, like some somebody older outside of Trader Joe's, they'll be like, oh, you know what helped me is beet juice. I had beet juice every day and now my arthritis is gone. You know, uh, there's always that. And if people say like, oh, all you need to do is this, all you need to do is that, they probably don't know. They probably don't even have mental illness as severely yeah. as, you know, many other people. Um, but you, you know, the concept of time too, if, if you want the med, if you want things to get better quickly, medications is a tool that you can use and there's no shame in that. And it can get it better quicker. Mm -hmm. If you want to do the sleep diet, managing the blood sugar, exercise, building your community, it's, it could still work. It probably still will work. But I mean, the time that you have to wait until it works is just going to be a lot longer. And yeah. everybody's going to want their own solution, their own mix of solutions. Right, right. So here's a, a question from the chat, and um, this is part of the question as well. So if it is too divisive of a topic, I get it. But what do you think of the recently passed California ban, California or Canada, CA ban on food dyes? I'm assuming that's California, but maybe it's Canada. Uh, I don't know anything about it, Canada or California. So I don't know which food dyes, but there's a lot of there's a lot of chemicals that are not um, that are, are are harmful to the body. A lot of them tend to be endocrine disruptors, so they either mimic estrogen or they block receptors for other hormones, and um, they are really terrible. So yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not sure if. I would ar argue against banning them. Um, and I guess if it's like, I'm free to eat whatever I want, I agree with that. But, um, you know, I think education probably is more important than r laws. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, red dye number three is the big one, apparently. Yeah. Well, 
I don't know if there's an argument here. You probably people probably shouldn't eat it, but if you eat it, I'm not going to criticize you. Are yeah. you eating your broccoli? That's all what I'll ask. You know, yes. in addition. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know what red dye number three is, um, but I do know that my father is allergic to some food dyes, whatever the food mm -hmm. dyes are that are in both Cheetos and nacho cheese Doritos. And he loves those two things. And so he'll eat them. <laughs> he'll eat them. And my mom and I will be like, you got to stop. You're going to start itching soon and <laughs> keep eating them. And then the next day he'll be like itching all day. And we're like, we told you so. <laughs> That's tough. Well, you know, there is uh, there's some a little bit of science behind casein from milk and gluten from wheat being uh, uh, what is it called? Casomorphin or a gluteomorphin, where especially I think they found this connection in children with autism that uh, they interact with the endogenous opiate receptors in your body. So kids with autism could be experiencing huh. harmful effects from the milk and the casein protein in the milk and similar to the gluten in the wheat, but they can't stop eating it. It's the only thing they'll eat because uh, the theory goes it produces an, an internal opiate response. So there's like an addiction, literally, interesting to these kinds of things. And so I don't know if that happens with your dad and the red dye or, you know, he just likes what he likes. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure he just likes what he likes because he doesn't seek out. He's not like constantly buying Cheetos or something. But hmm. he definitely if someone has a bag of Cheetos and they brought it to a family event, like he won't stop eating them. And mostly he's just like, these are really good. I'm going to keep eating them because they're very, very tasty um and delicious and no, despite my mom and i both kind of going you're gonna get itchy <laughs> he just he just keeps going uh give me one second my 16 year old just sent me a message um oh he wants me to turn off the lights outside okay apparently he's going to bed and he wants me to turn off the lights outside so i gotta do that for him real quick <laughs> that's responsible yeah <laughs> yeah he goes to bed pretty early um because if he same with my youngest. So my youngest goes to bed very early because if he doesn't, he's not going to wake up any later and he's just going to be really cranky. And mm -hmm. my 16 year old, if he doesn't go to bed at a decent hour, he's not going to be able to wake up any later because he sleeps as late as he possibly can already. And uh, he's just going to have a bad day the next day. So we kind of I've got them both where they're like, I understand I have to go to bed at this time. Um and my 16 year old actually this year just set his set his own bedtime. He's like, I think nine o'clock sounds like the right time for me. We're going to try it out. So that's all great. Right. You know, I, I always tell uh, parents of patients that, you know, as kids get older, you lose control, but you can gain influence hmm. if you can kind of lay it out for them. You know, I definitely found that to be true because I don't um, I don't have a lot of rules, but the ones that I do have, I try to explain very, very well and give my reasons and everything. And uh, we talk it through. And it, I I know that in his personal relationships and everything, my word is not law anymore. But I can tell that sometimes he listens to me. <laughs> oh, which is good for, good for, you know, a 16 year old, I feel like. <laughs> Yeah, I tried to put a coat on my six-year-old and it was cold outside the other day and he told me, no, I make my own choices. <laughs> okay. You're going to be cold. You're going to be cold. Be cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it's not going to be harmful, life-threatening right. in some right. way, sometimes natural consequences are better. <laughs> yeah. And he got to make his own choice. Uh, yeah, absolutely. In your practice, you focus on psychiatric medication, management, and therapy. How do you incorporate nutrition lifestyle recommendations into your treatment plans? And what results have you observed from doing that? Sure. Uh, for me, it's always patient-led. Some people don't believe or aren't interested. Some people have actually been to naturopaths or other alternative functional medicine providers and felt like they didn't get a lot of bang for their buck. Um, the number one intervention that I always offer my patients is therapy. My out, my visits are an hour long and medication is a portion of that, mostly therapy. And then sometimes I'll squeeze in the functional medicine, the lifestyle, the supplements, the diet. So we kind of dip our toes in the water with little supplements here and there to help with the sleep at night or to amplify whatever we might be doing with the medication. Or if I run blood work and see if, you know, Iron deficiency is really common and a super easy fix. 
it, it fix as in uh, to really clear out the fatigue, the brain fog, the depression, and the anxiety. And it, that's before you even start medication. So if you have something like that, that's kind of like a direct thing. But, you know, again, it's no, it's not going to produce a signal, you know, except for sleep. But eating better is going to make you feel like, eh, a little better. You know, controlling your blood sugar is going to make you feel like, mm, maybe I feel okay. You know, sleep, you probably definitely know if you get a good eight hours going from terrible sleep. But, uh, you know, it's just additive. And it's as when Patients come to me, it's the 11th hour because they mm. waited until the 11th hour to come see someone like me. And so we, we get things kind of cooled down. We build up uh, our strengths and our resiliency. And then once we get that mo momentum going, then I, then I kind of introduce it. And then it's up to them. So I usually start with supplements, uh, doing the sleep hygiene, getting exercise. Those are like the intermediate ones. And then down the road, if they're into it, we'll, we'll try like a diet change. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say supplements, is it like take this multivitamin or do you target specific things? Like if it's iron deficiency, you take something for iron, that kind of thing. Yeah, I guess two categories. I mean, if you have uh, an iron deficiency, then definitely iron and maybe some vitamin C. Right. That would be pretty straight up. Uh, iron deficiency is something you can verify with a lab test. Mm -hmm. So is maybe a B12 deficiency, maybe a folate deficiency. Most other things, it's you make a good guess, good educated guess from the collection of symptoms, body and mind, and you ask them about their diet. Sometimes I ask them to track for a few days just to give me like a good background there. And then um, there's supplements that can help for sleep, uh, sometimes herbs, B vitamins can be helpful, magnesium, everybody's heard of that. Um, that's, that's usually what I'm doing for people. Then there's some... Mm, kind of a uh, judicious use of supplements that can add to what their ADHD medication is doing for them or add to what their SSRI is doing for them. So it's all, you know, targeting the same thing and yeah. add it in slowly. And then people usually, uh, we make sure that they, they feel like it's working so they know it's worthwhile to keep, keep spending their own money on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, you talk about iron, uh, iron deficiency. I had, <laughs> I had iron deficiency on and off. Uh, before I had a hysterectomy. After I had a hysterectomy, I didn't have it anymore. So it was crazy how mm -hmm. that was, uh, how that was related. But I was on iron supplements, and I was on it was iron supplements, um, vitamin C, and something else. There was one more that the doctor was like, "You have to take all three of these in a specific order at specific times of the day." <laughs> and then after yeah. I had my hysterectomy, it was just gone. <laughs> sure, bleeding, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Exactly. Blood loss <laughs> is the number one. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, did you also notice if you want to share it's the uh, brain fog, fatigue, oh, anxiety, yeah. depression, any, any change there when you fixed it? Yeah. So I didn't even realize I didn't even realize that I had such that my fatigue was driven by an iron deficiency. The only reason I knew that I had an iron deficiency to begin with is because I was denied a few times in a row to donate blood because my um, hemoglobin mm. was too low. Right. And so they were right. like, Hey, you, the last three times you've been in to donate blood, we haven't been able to do it. You probably should see your doctor. And it was this very sweet little old, old grandmotherly mm -hmm. lady at the front desk uh, who yeah. was always there. And she was like, you probably should talk to your doctor, sweetheart. <laughs> and That's so I, I did. And they did lab tests and stuff. Um, and it was incredible. I started taking uh, everything that they told me to take. And all of a sudden, I wasn't as tired anymore. And I just didn't even realize that was related. I thought it was because I had young kids like... I thought it was pretty, pretty much just being a parent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, patients, um, you, you know, if, if you're not paying attention, you can miss it. But many people, I guess probably even including me sometimes, like, you know, it's, it's me. It just, it's just me. Yeah. Like the vague, amorphous, I don't know exactly how. I couldn't tell you the silence, but I know it's my fault. And then don't talk about it ever again. And that mm -hmm. is really something that I try to, you know, catch and explore to yeah. kind of get rid, banish those thoughts, you know, not helpful. Well, and in my case, if I have been tired for years, that's right. just normal just for tired, me at that point. Yeah. yeah. Like that's just, that's just how things are. This is, this is my normal. Why would I bring that up at a doctor's office or why would I bring that up with a nurse practitioner if that's just how I am, you know? So yeah, I, I absolutely. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, especially if you had a, a few seven minute appointments in your life. Right. Yeah, which right. I have lots and lots of those. Um, <laughs> so here's a comment from the chat as well. I feel like medication and supplements are great for getting you to a place where it's easier to make the changes that take longer to work. Yes. Like it's hard to even make the effort to cook your meals if you're low on iron, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Agreed. <clears throat> so you're... I well, oh, go ahead. Well, I just want to say one, one thing. That's the reason why. What's well, one of the main reasons why I wrote the book is, you know, seeing myself and imagining, hearing from my patients and imagining people in their kitchens, just like slumped shoulders, head cocked to the side, just opening the fridge for the fifteenth time, wishing that something magically would appear in there, and not just feeling super blah in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, write a book that would help people feel kind of more inspired and feeling it's more fun and then feel like if I make this sweet potato with pork loin and broccoli, what do I get out of that? This is something good that I'm going to get versus like, oh, I should, but I never do. You know, like all the negative stuff to kind of get that out of the way and be like, oh, I read this book and it's got these things and I'm going to get some B6, going to get some iron, all that stuff. So that's, that was the, one of the reasons why I wrote the book because of, you know, that moment right there. Yeah. Yeah, it, it can be really daunting sometimes because I do plenty of meal planning for what I'm going to cook and I order all the stuff at the mm. same time and everything. And um, even still, there are some days where I'm like, do I really want to make these pork chops and broccoli or do I want to just order something? <laughs> 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 do I have the energy to make this food that I know is going to be absolutely freaking delicious? Or do I want to order something? And most of the time, if I just eat a piece of cheese and wait five minutes, then I'm like, okay, I can actually cook. It's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, there's, a, you know, there's this calculator in our brain kind of balance between the anterior cingulate cortex, which is a, a calculator of effort versus reward. Yes. Which is really interesting. I mean, it's you kind of measure, you kind of have a sense on how much effort it's going to require and then how big the reward is or how long you have to wait for it. Or how certain it is and you, you do that question you mean you do that calculation and a lot of times it it gets computed in the wrong way yeah well and also so in addition to effort versus reward i have the added bonus even though earlier i was saying there's nowhere near here to really get food that, that's still true but because mm -hmm. of that the delivery fees are astronomical so i get the additional motivation of <laughs> you're gonna pay out the ass if you order food versus cook what you've already got to cook in your fridge so most of the time i wind up cooking but sometimes it's like and no then, yeah <laughs> and the fries are always cold Yes, the that's true. <laughs> that is <laughs> true. Like yeah, I wind up the kids a lot of the time will oh, order something that I'm like, mm, that is not going to be good by the time it gets here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you'll find in my book, there's recipes and they're all basic and simple and fresh and clean and good and doable and one page. You know, some of the other mental health cookbooks that I had seen as I was writing this book were, you know, kind of too fancy. And I just thought that was like insane. You know, mm -hmm. why would you have those recipes for people dealing with this issue? Um, but I, I try to make it fun in the nutrient game and then also make it easy to kind of help balance out that effort versus reward thing. Yeah, you need something to balance it for sure. I want to read a couple of more um, comments from the chat. So those meal kits are awesome for simplifying that effort, but it's not all of the effort. That is so true. But no stores, which means less people. So I count it as a major win. You're talking about me with the meal kits. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Growling says, I blamed being tired all the time on just being me for like four to five years until I finally went to a doctor, found out I had critical, you could fucking die anemia. <laughs> right. <laughs> what a way out to there. put that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got to, I mean, you have to look at it from a holistic perspective. And if you don't talk to your doctor about how you're feeling, how are they going to know? <laughs> yeah. It's what gets normalized, I guess. Right. Exactly. Your practice sees both kids and adults. Are there specific nutrition and lifestyle considerations for different age groups and uh, and also when it comes to assessing and addressing mental health issues? Yeah, kids are funny. I mean, they're uh, they're generally healthy, which, you know, you're, you're unlikely to find much off in a lab's cholesterol, iron, red blood cells. I mean, they're, they're so new. They're still they're still like a new car. You know, it's not going to break down for a while. <laughs> And so you, you don't find as much uh, ahas 
in their lab work and workups, but you do notice a bigger effect size with their diets. You know, they're so sensitive with their blood sugar and all the, the red dyes and the additives and the preservatives. Mm. Uh, there's so many good studies showing a, a pretty substantial, not amazing, but substantial effect when they take these kids and they put them on, you know, multinutrient and a good diet or the fine gold diet was from the 70s they removed all of the artificial preservatives and tested it on kids with adhd and you know it was their study so maybe a little bias but it showed that it works and i think if you know if you have a kid and you feed them pretty healthy and then halloween comes and you give them candy and you they're running around the house in circles you can tell the difference if you have a kid who he's you know sugar and stuff all you know if you try to give them a few days good days of clean eating you might actually notice that difference mm -hmm. so kids are different in those two respects um i think i forgot the original question uh just like nutrition and lifestyle considerations for different age groups and then also when it comes to mental health issues oh you know blood sugar is uh as you get older kids younger kids are not um they're not, nothing's really going to stand in their way from getting a snack but as you get older in your adolescent ages, there can be other maybe social or other kind of hangups on eating, or there can be like a badge of honor from going as long as you can from when you wake up until you go to bed without eating for some reason. And then the blood sugar is kind of up and down. Uh, a key thing that happens when your blood sugar dips is you're, you'll be hungry. And if you override that signal or don't feel the hunger signal, your body will go to its stress hormones to release the stored glucose in the form of glycogen and liver and muscles. And the price you pay for that is unlocking excess stress hormones. Mm -hmm. You know, so you go to like, oh, I don't need to eat. I'm going all day. I'm, I'm like running on a treadmill to like, I'm going to pull my hair out and I can't take it anymore. And I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, you got to eat. So blood sugar, I think, would be very important for adolescents and uh, adults. Um, that's one I see a lot of the time. Mm. Yeah. And I know that that's included in a lot of the lab tests and everything. Does, is that always caught on a lab test or is it variable a little Absolutely bit? Absolutely not. No, you know, uh, most of the lab markers are, except for a few, are what's going on at that moment that they're pulling the blood out of your vein. Mm. It could change seconds or minutes, hours later. You know, so it's like one moment in time with the lab. Blood, typical yeah. baseline blood work is getting. There's other markers like uh, hemoglobin A1C. And then there's like another one. Glycomark is another um, that can show you like the variation in the up and downs in the blood sugar. So there's some that can give you like a over time kind of general picture. But most of them are just that moment in time. You know, yeah. one, of the, one of the things I ask patients to do is if they can before their blood work, track some stuff the three days leading up to their blood work. You know, and then the time of day that they took the blood work and was it fasting and what time and how long were you fasting? Was it eight hours or was it 12? Mm -hmm. You know, depends on a lot of factors. So, you know, I think the story that people tell you, the symptoms that they tell you, the patterns they tell you, the diet they describe, all that information is probably more important than any one fasting blood glucose level on a lab on mm -hmm. one day. Yeah. Now. You mentioned the stress hormones and everything, and I want to talk about stress because that's a super common part of modern life, especially. And as we were talking about earlier, you know, I have a desk job. You you sit at a desk as well. Mm -hmm. um, so our bodies don't have the ability to, like, get that fight or flight stress kind of out there. So how does a high stress lifestyle without those kind of um, the ability to combat it a little bit as we would naturally affect our mental health? And what can folks implement to mitigate the negative effects of that? Uh, first half of my book is about stress and lifestyle. And then the second half is more sciencey stuff about the brain and brain functions and how nutrients make the brain function. But that first half is about stress. The main thesis there is that we should all aim lower. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I think <laughs> the villain in my book is modern day life yeah. and we are the heroes. And so if you, even if you're not stressed, you're overly stressed. If you live in 2023. Uh, if you think about the the news, what we consume, what we see, the images we see, you know, just thinking recently, uh, social media, uh, expectations, competition. We live in such a competitive, individualistic society, and you know, we're always 
clicking and looking for likes. It's just money, inflation. It's just everywhere. We are like the goldfish swimming in water, not realizing that we're in water because it's all around us. So I would argue that everybody's stressed and everybody is pushing and everybody is feeling strained and pressured. Mm -hmm. If you, if there's somebody out there who's not stressed, they can jump into the comments. But <laughs> I'm sure that I don't think they're going to be here. If they're not stressed, I don't yeah. think they're here. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, aiming lower, loving yourself, uh, finding what character strengths are unique to you and what you love about that. And just going with that and going down pursuits that that meet up with your strengths and maybe work on your weaknesses if you want, but feeling good about the labor you put into life versus the outcomes. And so that's kind of the aim, aiming lower. And it's all these expectations that we're under in modern day life without realizing we're under these expectations. Yeah, goes right back to that quote at the beginning, right? Just it's about, mm -hmm. kind of about, about the journey and not necessarily uh, what you're trying to accomplish that day. It's hard for me to say like, yeah, I'll aim lower. That's hard for me to say yeah, i'm me too yeah a little totally. bit of a perfectionist when it comes to a lot of things so <laughs> so what do you say to someone who's like i can't i can't aim lower it's not possible uh yeah well i understand i get it uh i, I don't know if if it's important that they respond to me in that moment mm -hmm. uh as much as it's important that i was thought provoking in that moment and they could sit and maybe stew on it a little bit let it marinate and, uh, you know, it's got to happen in the dark, in secret, in quiet. Nobody could hear in that moment where you give yourself permission to not try so hard. Yeah. It's, it's private first. Yeah. You know, nobody pounds the table and like, God damn it, you're right. This is the last podcast I ever do to promote this stupid book. I'm done. Never. <laughs> we don't say that. No. And But you can make little changes in it. And you can at least change the way you think about it. So you're not mm -hmm. adding up all the negatives as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The gut brain connection is fascinating to me, I think, as an area of study. How does the health in our gut microbiome affect our mental health and what dietary choices can support a healthy gut? There's a lot of connections. Apparently, it's science has recently realized it's attached your head to the rest of your body. You know, that's a medicine joke, which probably didn't land. But uh, in medicine, everything's kind of divided in um, specializations. So like the immune system and the uh, bladder specialist and brain specialist, neurologist, and then certain subtypes of neurologists. It's all just siloed. And uh, there hasn't been that great of a study or there, there really hasn't been promoted. Even a primary care doctor is going to struggle uh, identifying all the interconnections because that's kind of where the magic happens. So multiple, multiple connections between the gut. When we say gut, that's mostly the small intestine and the large intestine. And that's small intestine. You shouldn't have a ton of bacteria, but that is how it has inside of the small intestine has the little fingers, the villi, which grab the food and pull it in, grab the nutrients, I should say. The food goes into your stomach and then it has to get processed to small enough bits so that those little villi fingers can grab it in. Uh, and then the large intestine is where all the bacteria ferments. Uh, one connection is short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids will travel into the brain, cross the blood brain barrier and dampen neuroinflammation. Neuro brain inflammation is in a reaction of the immune system. And usually when it's uh, inflammation, it's considered excessive, chronic, low-grade, systemic, bad inflammation. But uh, if you get like a cut and it gets a little red, that would be good inflammation. The right. inflammation is going to kind of carpet bomb the area and make sure you don't get infection. So some inflammation is good, but mostly when we talk about inflammation, it's bad in, in the way we're talking about it. The short-chain fatty acids will gravitate up to the brain and uh, kind of quell the immune cells in there and, and limit neuroinflammation, which can overexcite the brain. Cause, you know, brain fog and extra anxiety, sour moods. So you don't want no inflammation. Uh, if you eat prebiotics and healthy fibers, you will get the short chain fatty acids and it'll go to your brain and it'll calm the inflammation. Short chain fatty acids are the poop of uh, healthy bacteria in your mm -hmm. gut. So we eat their poop. Hey, and know. it makes us healthier. And that's, Circle of that's life. the story. <laughs> It's true. And so uh, all the lactobacillus, 
bifidobacter, uh, some of the spores, the bacillus bacteria. You, we want to, we all have those in there. It, the foods that we eat will preferentially certain fibers, uh, like from root vegetables, will feed those bacteria, help them populate, and then help them make more of themselves and help make more of that short chain fatty acid, which is going to get to the brain. That's just one connection. There's mm -hmm. kind of several others, but you know. All you need to focus on is just uh, whole foods, uh, root vegetables, uh, garlic, onions. That's really good in prebiotics. Hey, I just love garlic a healthy and diet onions. And there. So <laughs> oh, I I look at garlic like it's vanilla in a dessert. <laughs> I kind of measure with my heart when it comes to that one. So <laughs> actually, you know uh, the allium family, which is garlic, onions, leeks, all those ones. They're high in uh, vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 has a special role in the brain. If you have adequate vitamin B6, it will be there to help recycle an excitatory neurotransmitter into the calming neurotransmitter GABA. Oh, I mean, people nice. have probably heard of the supplement GABA. Yeah. People have all heard of the medications, al al um, alprazolam, uh, I'm trying to say the generics, uh, lorazepam, clonazepam. All those medications activate the GABA receptor. They make it more uh, open better. And so then the GABA molecule can be hitting that brake signal. You know, so it's like tapping on the brakes in your brain to kind of help you fall asleep, help you remain calm, quell, and kind of silence the amygdala, the, the fear center of the brain. Mm -hmm. Garlic. So I just need to eat more garlic and onions to yeah. fall asleep faster. I I don't know that I can eat. I don't know that I personally can eat more garlic and onions than I already do. I eat a lot. I eat a lot of those. <laughs> just don't stop. Just don't stop. I, won't, I won't be stopping. Now, you mentioned prebiotics. So what's the difference between, I mean, I know like prebiotic, probiotic, postbiotic, the terms of what the differences are, but effectively, where do you get those from in your diet? Sure. Uh, the root vegetables are really good sources. Potatoes, sweet potatoes carrots, even any, uh, even non-starchy vegetables, uh, the lettuces, um, peppers, onions, they all come pre-installed with those, uh, good prebiotic fibers. And then there's, uh, various supplements you could get chicory root and inulin. And, uh, they have some fun names, guar gum and, uh, Beta arabinogalactan. Just there's so many that are out that there. That sounds like uh, a space know. chemical. <laughs> yeah, think about the the root vegetables. That's that's gonna get you what you need. Uh, but also like rice and bread, if that's what you're eating, you know, that'll give you some benefit. Yeah. So just focusing on that that whole diet kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, whole foods, grains, root vegetables. That would be like a great place to start. Yeah. What advice can you offer for folks who want to make sustainable changes to support their mental health through nutrition if they want to take that first step through nutrition and lifestyle choices? Where do they start? Uh, movement, I would say. You know, you got to you gotta move. Walk until you're warm, jog until you sweat, and then stop. I mean, uh, movement is really, really healthy, healthy for the brain. The brain is the orchestrator of movement. The brain helps us manage with our feet to get from point A to point B. In the abstract realm of eating healthy or getting healthy or working on my mental health or just overcoming a breakup or a challenge or, or you know, processing anger and, and moving on and letting go, that's a point A to point B. You know, movement is the best number one place to start. Um, some, sometimes actually, you know, uh, kind of a decent area around my office and some patients I could just tell and I ask them if they want to go for a walk. And so we'll go for, it's a half mile loop around the little complex I'm at. Sometimes we'll do one, two loops. And um, I, I don't know exactly what's happening, but they're, it, it works. The next time they come in, they're more relaxed, they're more calm. It's just kind of, they've made some changes. The walkie talkie is really, really the great first step, I think. I like that walkie talkie. That's good. Um, my kids and I, we didn't over the summer because it was 60 days of over 100 degree temperatures and it was just too hot. Um, but my kids and I walked to the mailbox and back, which is it winds up being about three quarters of a mile there to our mailbox oh, wow. and back. Um, and it's fun because 
you know, then you're, I get to, as a parent, it might not be fun for them, okay, but it's fun for me. I get to talk to them about like their day and how they're doing and like all this stuff while we're walking and everything. Um, and I think that they're more open. We talk every day. Whenever I'm driving them home from school, we talk every day about their day, about things that went well and things that didn't go well and all these things, right? But whenever I'm talking to them on a walk, it's like they get a little deeper somehow. They just get a little, yeah. it's a little bit of a different conversation, sure. not because yeah. of anything that I do. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think I ever really connected that with the actual like motor movement of walking and your brain. So that's kind sure. of- Sure, well, I mean, it's, I would say two parts. I mean, the more you're moving in that kind of rhythmic fashion, the more your defenses are down and the hmm. more like thoughts will kind of flow. And then I think, you know, when you're, when you're eyeball to eyeball with somebody, there's always a degree of threat, you know, which I, psychiatry and therapy have never figured out how not to look directly at someone. <laughs> They've never really <laughs> created rooms where you look kind of at a 45 degree angle, but the walks are kind of great if, if, uh, if you can fit them in. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it can be too much to just stare at somebody face to face. It can, it can create a, a little defense. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's a good point as well. Psychomotor is a big word. I like that word. Uh, probably just because they're distracted by walking, which is forcing them to not block. Like you said, defenses are down. It's just like mm-hmm. a field sobriety test where you have to count while walking or balancing. I would be, if I ever have to do a field sobriety test, I am fucked because I have awful balance to begin with. And I'm just going to be like, I'm going to fail, but let me do a breathalyzer test and I'll pass. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So your book, which is The Mental Wellness Diet, explores the relationship between nutrition and mental health. And we've talked about it some already throughout the show, but what are some of the key insights from your book and about how our dietary choices can impact our well-being? Sure. Uh, Those last five chapters are the five functions, uh, respond, fuel, build, balance, and protect. And uh, I chose those words because they're one word and they're easy. And then behind them is, is, it's, is, is, is a unique function of the brain that's really helpful. That kind of crosses all the, most all of the uh, psychiatric illnesses, mostly depression, anxiety, ADHD type stuff. Um, so RESPOND is about neurotransmitters and what are the nutrients, the micronutrients, vitamins and minerals that are needed to literally create and manufacture serotonin and dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, acetylcholine. And these are really critical neurotransmitters that are uh, along little stoplights along the brain that gate traffic and help us allow us to feel things or not feel things or focus on things or let things go. So you just want to have ample supply so you can respond to life happening all around you. So that chapter kind of explains that. Then it will have a diagram in the book uh, kind of depicting, you know, how the neurotransmitters are made and at each step where each if it's vitamin B3, if it's vitamin B2, if it's iron, folate, vitamin C, where it all fits in. Next chapter would be fuel. And that's about how the brain is really greedy when it comes to oxygen and glucose. And you really need to have healthy perfusion, blood flow to the brain, which a lot of us don't really think about, but is very important. Glucose and oxygen. And you need the uh, mitochondria in the brain to be producing the energy. So that the, uh, all of the brain can work, especially the, the frontal cortex. The frontal cortex is the adult of our brain. It can, you know, reach back further back into the brain and, and shush the fear center. It can hold off. It can hold off impulse, impulses and, and certain behaviors and can make us, help us make the good choice and feel good about making the good choice. So you need fuel for that. Build is about the fatty substances that coat neurons the axons, the long tendrils of the, of the neurons that reach across the brain. And that's what makes the brain white, is this fatty myelin sheath. and increases the speed a hundredfold of uh, messages in and across the brain. So, you, you know, you, you would have like a static TV if that coaxial cable didn't have all that rubber and insulation around it. The neurons are the similar. Um, that's build. And then balance and protect are related. This is about neuroinflammation, about how inflammation and, and other factors can overexcite the brain. And when there's too much static, too much excitation, it's hard to have a singular focus, have a singular signal that you can just stay on in the brain for very long. And that relates to 
ADHD and depression and um, anxiety. And so there's a, a host of nutrients that can support that GABA in the inhibition to have a nice counterbalance to tap on the brakes every once in a while so you can steer in the right direction. And then the uh, immune system needs to be balanced. These are all the fat-soluble vitamins, those flavonoids, which I didn't really get into, um, tryptophan, vitamin D, omega-3s, magnesium, zinc. These are all really important to make sure that the immune system isn't causing static and irritation in our brain. Hmm. Whew, so that's the rundown. <laughs> that, was, that was quite the rundown. You mentioned tryptophan, and now I'm on Thanksgiving to get here faster. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what inspired you to write this book? How, and, and can you talk a little bit about what it's based on, the uh, ancient wisdom and evolving science and modern day options? Yeah, when I was going through school, I got into functional medicine. It was for my final project. I clicked on this one blog, and then it led me to another blog. And then I kind of realized the whole field of functional medicine was out there at that time. And I went to a conference. And at the same time, I had a split screen. I was learning about conventional medicine. Like, if you have this diagnosis, give this medication. And it was very simple and straightforward. Then there was all these, like, preventative things and lifestyle things and extra things you could do with functional medicine. And this book is kind of trying to meld the two. It's the culmination of my education and all my life experiences and all the smart things that smart people have told me over time. And it's, a, you know, and it's kind of a way I, I give it out free to patients and um, offer the audio book. And just if I can help people combine it all and help it all make sense, um, that, that feels good. Yeah. Sometimes the inspiration is just about I, I want to help someone. I want to help more people. More people. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, knowledge. Knowledge is power. And we don't have all the equal kinds of knowledge out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it is time for the magic moment. I literally have a magic wand right here. So if you mm -hmm. could wave this magic wand and eliminate one common opinion, misconception, or theory surrounding mental illness, disabilities, or talking about mental health, what would it be? Yeah, I think it's that um, it must be just it just must be me. Mm. If I could had a, if I had a magic wand, I would wave it and make sure that um, I mean, just today, someone I, I see would dealing with someone in their life that's been very difficult. And, uh, you know, sometimes I get, you know, I'm very supportive and, and fair and balanced, but I'm very supportive. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's terrible that that person is kind of doing this still. It's so annoying. And, uh, you know, they came in today and they were like, yeah, well, well, that was nice. That was nice for you to say it. But I'm like, but you know how I feel. You know, I get all riled up when you <laughs> I'm like you question whether or not I would think that that was out of line what they you said that they did this recent week. And they're like, yeah, I just I, it gets to me and I think it's me and I get in my head. And, you know, people are walking around with all kinds of thoughts and all kinds of self-criticism, sometimes self-hate. And you'll never know. And it's got to stop. Yeah. And yeah, that's, be, that's maybe my mission. That would be a great one. If, if you could yeah. just poof it out of existence, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I wish, right? Yeah. Well, Chad, if y'all have any more questions or comments and you want to uh, make sure that we get them while Justin is still here with us, feel free to pop them into the chat. I'm going to share your socials one more time as well, Justin, just so that people can connect with you. Uh, website, blog, Instagram, book, Facebook, all those good things are in the chat. So feel free to click on any of those if you want to connect. And then I will just open it up to you and say if there's anything we didn't talk about or anything you want to throw out there as far as resources or recommendations, uh, I'll just give the floor to you for a little bit. Um, sure. Well, yeah. So I, I think that there's, um, I guess I would say, you know, a, a lot of the questions I get, I think I, I think we have to acknowledge that the science isn't always there yet. Hmm. And the science sometimes is pretty far away from being there. Uh, and a lot of times the way that we initially digest all this health information is like, is it true that this works for that? Is it true that this stops that? Is it true that this is the cause of everything? And the answer is always, well, uh, depends or not really, or that's not exactly it. And so um, a lot of times I feel like we all need the answers first and then we'll get started. And ironically, once we get started, then we kind of find our own answers. And it doesn't have to be even anything in my book or anything about anybody else says. I mean, everybody's going to be able to find their own answer if they just get started. So and that's one point of encouragement I'd like to offer. Yeah. And that's 
That's a good one as well, because that's something that my therapist has actually said to me. Like, you okay. don't have to have everything lined up exactly right to start. You don't you don't have to know the outcome before you start. And that goes, okay, listen, now we're circling all the way back to the beginning again, because it's mm-hmm. more about, <laughs> everything's going back to that. It's more about just starting, just doing, just being in that moment and that kind of thing. So uh, I think that that's. Oh, uh, now I have to listen to my therapist. <laughs> and now, now that two people said it. Yeah, now, right. <laughs> now we got to pay attention. I do sure. listen. I do listen to her. If you watch this, Angel, I do listen to you. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us here today. I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, chat, give me just a minute. I'll be back uh, right after I disconnect with Justin.
That was a great conversation. I hope that y'all enjoyed it as much as I did, because I know that that was really, um, really a good convo. Let me turn this music down a little bit. And I had to go refill my water and everything also, check on the kids, etc., etc. But we're back now. I've got the cup with it. I've got the question queue closed. <laughs> <laughs> All that good stuff. We'll say goodbye to YouTube for now. Thank you for tuning in over on YouTube. I'm going to cut it off here for you guys, and I'll continue on Twitch with some, maybe some seven days to die. See